Welcome, Ashley. Hey, thanks for having me. So I know that you know Georgia. You guys work together at iMore. And so I'm <sighs> so glad to have you both here. <laughs> we Hi, caused Georgia. a lot of trouble together. So I don't so know if you should trouble. have us together on the same show. It might you be may dangerous. Have to you may have to separate us at some point. <laughs> okay, well, there is that division between you two on the on the TV right there. That, that, that just stay on your side. Don't cross that. <laughs> no, stop touching me. Stop touching me. <laughs> So Ashley, you were you were first at E3, then you were at VidCon. E3 probably seems like a million years ago. I know you've been pretty busy. Um, but what can you tell us about what was announced at E3 in regards to PlayStation VR? Well, PlayStation VR uh, really just had well an official launch date, which is great, and then um, the pricing still three ninety nine. And then uh, we got to see a ton of launch window games, and so that was the most exciting thing for me uh, because I right now. I am building a new PC. I, I'm in the process of that, but I don't have any VR headsets for PC yet. So this will sort of be, uh, this is the one that I know I'm getting. I've pre-ordered it. I'm ready. And I was a little concerned about what was going to come out and was it going to be good compared to everything that we've seen with Oculus and Vive. And so I was, uh, I, I'm proud and, and very pleasantly surprised to say that things look good that, uh, for PlayStation VR. And I was very impressed with what I saw. Um, we still see a lot of sort of experiences. Um, the Batman Arkham uh, experience was very kind of short, but also really cool. Like you were able to take the cowl and put it on, physically pick up the cowl, put it on your face, and then look in the mirror. It was really neat. Um, there were a lot of good horror games, which I'm sure we're going to see a lot of Let's Plays from with YouTubers and Twitch streamers. And I'm sure everybody will love that because people love to see other people get scared on the internet. And then, um, but yeah, it, it's overall, like I think the launch window stuff, which is really fascinating. And I, I am, I'm pleasantly surprised and actually anticipating PlayStation VR now, as opposed to sort of being a little bit, uh, kind of not hedging my bets, but definitely a little nervous about, you know, what, is it going to be high quality? Is it not? But I do think there's some hurdles that PlayStation needs to sort of get over before it really kind of takes off in the way that I'm imagining they hope it does. Well, Georgia, you have the Vive and the Oculus. Is this something that you're also planning to get? We might get it, I think, and, and Ashley, you can tell us, but um, I think that in comparison, it's going to be a lower quality play experience because you end up having the motion controllers, but you're still, is it still a seated experience or standing experience versus something that you can interact with the room, Ashley? It's not, it's not like Vive where you're walking around the room. It's a little bit more like Oculus where it's a lot of the games are intended to be seated, um, but there are games you're able to play uh, standing. So they had the one with the aim controller and you were, I, it was very weird though, because you're standing and you're kind of, you know, holding the aim controller and you're shooting these spiders, which I have to say the lag on that was really impressive. There's little to no uh, delay in the response time, which is super important with VR. You want to make sure that all of that stuff is kind of lined up properly. Um, but, but as it was happening, I real as I was moving forward, because I was standing, I really wanted to be running, which I guess is why, uh, you know, the, the Virtuix Omni is a thing and, and why people really want it. And now I get it. I'm like, oh, that's, yeah, I, I can see where people would want that. Um, but yeah, it's definitely a seated experience. I mean, a console play is just, you're, it's designed for you to be played on your couch. And so I think um, there's a lot of kind of questions about how to design games that are engaging and exciting in virtual reality while still sort of keeping you seated. And I think that that's, um, and also keeping you from getting sick, which was one of the things that sort of happened this year with Resident Evil. Um, the Resident Evil 7 demo, I guess, made a lot of people motion, gave them a lot of motion sickness. Um, but I don't, I believe it's because it was running in 30 frames per second, which I, and if I'm not mistaken, Oculus and Vive are both 90, right? Is that, I think that's like the threshold that they're kind of requiring for developers. So, um, so yeah, I think they have to bring up that FPS significantly. And also one of the things we kind of don't consider is that, so when PlayStation first came on the scene, we got really used to, uh, or we had to get used to moving the camera around with the right thumbstick was something we never had to do before. And it was exciting, but it was also very awkward. And so now in VR, you're kind of having to unlearn that. And after, you know, so many console generations, it's hard to do. And so in Resident Evil uh, 7 Biohazard, so you're wearing the virtual reality headset, let's say, 
uh, I'm looking down at a piece of paper, uh, and one of the sort of experimental formats for controls moving, uh, turning is to sort of tap the right thumbstick right or left, and then you sort of move 40 degrees right or left uh, in a circle. And Resident Evil 7 does not do that yet. It's just free movement um, in terms of turning your character. So if I'm looking at something at a table with my virtual reality headset on my PSVR on, and I uh, back up with the left thumbstick, and then by default or just because I have been conditioned to do so, I want to strafe and I hit the right thumbstick to move sideways. My head is still looking in this direction, but my whole body in the game swings this way. And it just did not make people feel great. So it's it, they have to keep people from, it's so important, they have to make it right. They have to keep people from getting sick, especially in that launch window. They have to. Yeah, I've uh, had my kids were playing with the uh, Vive for a few weeks, and then they started playing with the Oculus here at work, and, you know, they immediately got sick. And it's funny because, like, they, they are 11-year-old boys, so they will keep doing it and probably until they throw up. Like, you say that you have to, but, like, you know, for... Uh, and, and I'm not sure it's recommended for 11-year-old boys, so maybe that's why, because you would just do it until you got sick. But, yeah, I totally agree with you. Now, and what about the, the horror? You talk about uh, the game Here They Lie, which is good for fans of Lovecraft. Uh, and, I mean, how, how scary is it compared to just playing a regular video game, horror in VR? Um, I, so I'm very affected by sound. And so to have a surround sound headset is very, can be very visceral. Uh, but I think with virtual reality, you're adding a whole other element of immersion into gaming. And so horror games really kind of take on a whole new life in virtual reality. So Here They Lie was extremely surreal. It wasn't a realistic horror game. I mean, there were bur there's a burning man with a suitcase that's 12 feet tall that climbs out of a portrait and, and, and walks after you, you know, and starts burning things down. Uh, you're in, there's, there's guys with, <laughs> there's men with rat heads uh, that jump out and attack you and things like that. And so it's, it's certainly not a, a mired in realism horror game. I mean, you could even say a post-apocalyptic zombie game would mostly feel real with the exception of zombies. And that's not the case with a game like Here They Lie, but it still feels so much more foreboding. I mean, you, you just get a sense of that kind of darkness and this, this kind of environment that just really, you know, you take off the headset and you're just like, wow, okay. Uh, I had a moment where I was playing Here They Lie and I, I snuck in, and this is so terrible. So when I was a kid, my mom used to hide behind doors and jump out and scare us. <laughs> and that was the funniest thing, And um, which is why I attack people now who jump out at me. Uh, no, right, um, right. so she, she jumps out and, like, scares us. So, of course, in virtual reality, the first thing you want to do, you have the headset on, is you want to look around corners. You want to look. And so of I walked in a doorway, and I'm like, I don't trust this. I look around the corner, and there's a guy. And everybody at Tangentleman, the developer, was like, oh, you found him. Like, that's such a bummer. You didn't, you know, you didn't get surprised. And I'm like, oh, try, like, okay, I'm good now. Thank you. Like, I'm just going to walk through the door to continue. And so I went through there, and I knew what was going to happen. But even then, because virtual reality is so much more immersive, it was still, I still screamed a little bit, like, at this pu very public facing a demo experience in front of a bunch of people when that rat man attacked me. And it was just, it was bizarre. Uh, so it, I I loved it, but it was also, um, gosh, I can't remember who it was, but somebody online was mentioning, uh, what does this mean for games like Fallout, where it's it's incredibly realistic and where you know you're having to physically lift your arm to shoot somebody, a person, as opposed to you know a zombie or a monster, an alien or whatever. Um, what does that mean for us as a society? Will it change us psychologically? Like, I don't know. I don't know the answers to these questions. I mean, um, you know, I don't, I don't believe in the whole, like, direct correlation of, like, violence in video games causes people to be violent. I don't, I, for me personally, I don't think that that's true. Um, I've played many violent games and I seem okay, I guess. Maybe I'm a little weird, but... <laughs> I don't think that's the violent games. It could and be your mom be behind the... Yeah, yeah, it's probably my mom. Like, I'd rather play my mom. So, um, so, yeah, I mean, it's... But but at the end of the day, it's it's sort of one of those things where it's really immersive, and we have to think about, you know, how we design games. I, I think we have to think about as designers, if you're designing a game, like, okay, uh, you know, I need to think about what this means for a person when they actually complete these actions. 
Um, it's, it's so different. It's so different. And, and in a way, it's amazing. I mean, it's what we've always wanted in virtual reality. It's, it's such an interesting thing to sort of have all these concepts and ideas that we had back in the 90s when, when virtual reality sort of had a fad period where it was terrible and you had to go pay $20 to play five minutes at a county fair. Um, but we're finally getting to a point now where it's like, this is what I always thought of when I thought of virtual reality. And this is what I read about in books like Snow Crash. And so, so we have to think about what that will do to us as a society, I guess. It's, it, it's an interesting sort of thing. I mean, it may not change us at all, like who knows, but if, I mean, if augmented reality and virtual reality is going to be as big as I think it is, um, I, I look forward to seeing how people sort of respond and react to, to being in it. And some people will have the same problems as uh, MMOs. They'll get addicted to virtual reality or they'll get addicted to augmented reality, like whatever that is. Um, it's, it's really fascinating to think about. And, um, and I, I don't know, like I said, I don't know what the answer is, uh, but I, I do think it's really interesting. Well, Georgia, what do you think? I mean, do you think there's any um, truth to, I mean, do you think there's any way our brains are being affected um, by VR in a different way, anything being rewired by this immersive experience? Well, uh, for the good and for the bad, yes, it does work. Um, so the, one of the first Call of Duty games was used by the military in order to kill, help the kill ratio of soldiers. And it did. It works to become more effective. We can depersonalize more if we've done things. On that same effect, we've already been using, and long ago we've been using virtual reality systems in order to help people dealing with traumas or fears or phobias. And mm -hmm. there's systems out there to help people do that. And it's kind of like the in-between, like, you know, when I'm helping someone with a fear or phobia of, say, spiders, we start off by pictures of spiders, GIFs of spiders, videos of spiders from cartoon, then to more realistic. Virtual reality would work perfectly in between that and when I actually grab a poor spider and bring it to work with me to interact with a real spider. And we really rely strongly on our visual field. And so because of that, they're already thinking of dealing with social anxiety through virtual reality. And mm -hmm. it is effective. So it can be used for the good and it can be used from the bad. But I think that Ashley brings up a really good point because it can also cause some post-traumatic stress. If you're doing something, we already feel that the characters that are online are real and we care about them to a certain extent. And so seeing graphic violence in that setting, whereas we see it as more realistic than not, can cause trauma to people. And so we want to make sure that you're aware of what you're getting into and you're aware of what age the person is that this is being targeted to. Yeah, I think, um, Georgia, that's like a really good point. It's, it's very similar to sort of um, buying a Grand Theft Auto game for your kid. I think, like, people should know their kid or their, you know, what they should know themselves or know their kid well enough to sort of understand like, hey, is this appropriate? Can they handle this? Um, can I have a conversation about this? And other than that, like, I mean, it feels like that is, it kind of falls in the same wheelhouse, I would guess. Yeah. Yeah, it does, except this one is even more realistic. And so because of that, and like I'm the same thing with you as with the sound and with the creepiness of playing a game like Brookhaven, I am scared to death in this game. And I have to keep on reminding myself, you know, this isn't real. There aren't really zombies there. But often I'm playing a game on the Vive and I, you know, lean on the floor and I fall over the floor and I'm scared to death because I what the lean-to that I thought I was leaning against is not there. Or if I'm on the ledge of something, I'm actually feeling the same experience as if I was really on a ledge. I'm walking over sure. bricks that are on the floor. I don't want to get too close to it. And so because of that, yeah, I think that it can have a little bit more of a lasting effect on people that use it. And we'll only know within, you know, five, 10 years to see what that effect really will be.